one question that came up when I was talking to some of the, the students is uh, two or three things. Uh, one is that essentially if you look at the class of these types of games, one way to partition them is integrable versus non-integrable. So how do, you, how do you detect that? So um, the way you detect that, uh, let me, okay, I'm trying to see what to erase. Uh, let me start from here. This is easier to write on, okay? I'll, uh, use this. Okay, let, me, let, me, let me erase this, yeah. Okay, so um, okay, so so when you start with a game, right? So if I start with a game, let's call it theta x, right? So your first, you know, if you were to analyze this, one thought is to say, okay, I'm going to take this game, and I'm going to get the associated map f. Okay, how do I get that? Just by using, differentiating the thetas. Once I get this, I check and see, so this is like a roadmap. Is this, and if that is the case, it's integrable. No, non-integrable. And this allows us to use optimization theory. This allows us to use VI theory. Okay, so that's kind of the set of steps. Now, um, a second question that also came up was the following. Suppose I tell you that the map, um, the map that I get is this. How do I construct this? other optimization problems. So suppose I get 2x1 plus 3x2. So if you write down the, if you write down the Jacobian of this, that's just 2, 3, 3, 5. Now if you look at this, if it's symmetric, you can see this, you can say, oh, this is, okay, so because it's symmetric, I can see this as the Hessian of some function. Now, because it's a Hessian of a function, then I need to integrate, okay? So I need to say, oh, okay, this is, uh, if the second derivative is two, then this essentially is gonna be a function where you have f of x is equal to half, no, it's two, uh, two, yeah, two, no, uh, x one squared, I'm sorry plus 5 x2 squared over 2 plus 3 x1 x2. Now you'll get used to this. Now if it's a very nasty expression, it might be difficult for you to e even establish that it's symmetric. Because if you have some nasty expressions which are nonlinear, to show that they're equal might be a pain. So it may be that figuring out that they're symmetric itself is a problem. In which case, just move to VI theory. Just move to VI theory then, right? If, if it's so difficult to show it's integrable, it's not clear if it's in, it is indeed integrable, then just move to VI theory. Okay, so is this, uh, this was a question I think, Christy, you asked this question about how to guess this, right? So the, you just have to literally go ahead and integrate. And somebody else, Antonio asked me that. No? Somebody else asked me this. Um, so is this clear how to go to this function? Okay. Okay, the next question I'm going to just talk about 
is um, what happens when you have certain types of generalized Nash or shared constraint structures, can you still write equilibrium, can you still um, construct similar approaches? And I'll show you how to do that, okay? So suppose I gave you this problem. Now, remember I had theta 1, x 1, and I had x1 and x1, minimize theta 2, x2, x2 and x2, okay. That was a, the type of problem we looked at. Suppose I make one change and I add c of x1 comma x2 is greater than 0 and, I, and this is called a shared constraint, so let's call this a shared constraint. Actually, I'm going to make it uh, less than equal to 0 and the reason I want to make it less than equal because then if c is convex, the set stays convex, okay. Does everybody see the motivation for this? Because often what happens is that your strategy sets are coupled by the decision making, uh, the decisions of your competitors, okay. So one way to deal with this, and, and so the question was, how do you deal with it? How do you deal with this from the standpoint where, um, actually let me make this linear, even easier to, to so that we, exp becomes easier to write this. So suppose I say AX1, plus bx2 is less than b, ax1, bx2, okay. So what you do is, you basically first relax this constraint using a common Lagrange multiplier. So now when you s relax this constraint, let's talk about this. So you relax, relax shared constraint. Now, if you relax the shared constraint, what do you get? You get minimize, bless you, theta 1 minus, oh sorry, plus lambda transpose ax1 plus bx2 minus b, x1 lying in capital X1, and minimize theta 2 x2 plus lambda transpose ax1 bx2 minus b x2 in x2 and you have another so you have 1 2 and you have a complementarity requirement between ax plus b Okay. Is given, right? In this case, it's given. So in this case, it's a parameter. Lambda and x1 are parameters. Lambda and x2 are parameters. Okay. So now, now, what you can do is, if you want to solve this problem, right? If you want to solve this problem, how would you do it? So first of all, let's write down the optimality conditions of this problem. Okay, or the variational conditions. So the variational conditions of this, um, yeah, sir. Yeah. So in this case, I'm going to assume. I'm, that's why it's called a. It's a, it's a particular type of equilibrium I'm looking for, where the lambda is the same. So they're sharing the multiplier. It's a common multiplier. Point is ma lambda is expressing the sensitivity of the objective to a change in the boundary of that constraint, right? Right, and because it's a shared constraint, where so the thing is that you're exactly right. It could be a lambda one and a lambda two. So we're looking for solutions where lambda one is equal to lambda two. For that class of problems, are a little easier. 
right? There are problems where that's not the case, where it's lambda 1 cannot be equal to lambda 2. I'm interested in non-shared or non, uh, not the common multiplier setting. But is it pretty common that it happens that lambda 1 is equal yeah, to Yeah, so for instance, in a lot of cases, like if you have uniform pricing auctions, uh, in, particularly in electricity markets, this lambda represents the price associated with the supply demand constraint. Now, when you run the market, there's a single price. So you have to, in some sense, use that price. So for, from a physical standpoint, it's natural that that, that price is used. Now, f from a game theory standpoint, it might be viewed that, that um, my conjecture of the price might be different. And so that's why people are interested in looking at non-shared. I can never get this, I'm sorry. Last time I really broke it, so I don't Yeah. Okay, so now that I have that. So, first question. Second question. So, right now, is lambda shared because the constraint is shared? Yeah, the lambda is, is, not, is, is basically a parameter to both, and I've kept it common. Uh, as, what's your name? Esan. Esan. So, as Esan said, I could have made this lambda 1 and lambda 2. But if I do that, then I need two separate constraints here, two separate complementarity requirements. So I don't want to do that. I just keep it common. And the reason I keep it common, you'll see when I write it out. Okay. But from an economic standpoint, from an economic standpoint, this has a has an has some economic intuition, uh, and but also the the possibility that you have non-shared multipliers is also, you know, is is completely fair. Okay. Okay, so now if you want to write down the equilibrium conditions of this, what do you get? So what I want to do for this case is to, to drop this and just make it x1 greater than or equal to 0, just make it to make it easy. Oh, sorry, x2. Okay. So now if you write down the optimality conditions of the first problem, what do you get? You get 0. Second problem, <coughs> and Does everybody see this? Okay. All I've done is written the first order optimality conditions, and I've added the, this constraint. Okay. Everybody with me? Okay. Next thing that I do. So now this is, if you look at it, it's an instance of a complementarity problem. So this is also zero, right? What does this mean? Uh, actually, I shouldn't say zero. Oh, sorry. R three plus. This is R three plus. This is a complementarity problem. Okay. Um, let me write that in clean. Otherwise, I just shoved it there. So. So this is. This is an instance of a complementarity, uh, sorry. So this is an instance of a complementarity problem. 
Now remember, complementarity problems can also be written as variational inequality problems. A lot of this theory can be invoked there. The one thing is that in complementarity problems, can the set ever be compact? Can the underlying set ever be compact? Can it be bounded? No, because it's a cone. It goes on forever, right? So then the, 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 the statements are a little more refined. But, but we also know the sets are much more, have some structure. They're cones. Okay, so you might lose compactness in some cases. But you benefit from the standpoint that you have structure. But what is interesting about this is, this thing has a skew symmetric structure. So if you look at this Jacobian of this map, the Jacobian of this map has this structure. It's basically something like this. It's h of x, where this is symmetric. Um, and you get some C transpose minus C zero. See, so just look at this. This, you're going to get, uh, let me write this more carefully. So you're going to get the Hessian of theta one, the Hessian of theta two, a transpose, b transpose, minus a, minus b, 0. Okay. So this is a skew symmetric system. Okay. Now why is, why is that recognition important? Well, the reason why the recognition is important is um, once I have a skew symmetric system, then I can rewrite, I don't like blue. Yeah, it's hard to see it, right? Uh, I need something bright. So then what you can write, so if you look at this, and again, this comes from some experience, what you can do is you look at this problem and you notice that it's the optimization, it's the KKT conditions of this problem. Lagrange multiplier is lambda. So if you wrote out the KKT conditions of this problem, you would get, this is necessary and sufficient, the KKT conditions are necessary and sufficient with respect to this, sorry, the, the, so that complementarity problem which, is, which are really the KKT conditions, um, x lambda, f of x lambda. Okay, so this is where the skew symmetric structure. So to Asan's point, if I had taken non-shared multipliers, so suppose I had made this lambda one and lambda two, what happens then is that the optimality conditions that you get here, you don't get the skew symmetric structure. And uh, no, don't use the word non-integrable. Uh, it's not the question of integral. It's the the because remember, the, the, the term integrability somehow is reserved for constructing this optimization. Here again, we've constructed an optimization problem. But you look at the, the Jacobian, the Jacobian is skew symmetric, and the upper block is to be integrable. You see this block, this block here, I could change this. I could make this theta 1x, theta 2x, and then I'm, I'm left with a full matrix here. in uh, 1, 1, and what you need is, you need this to be integral, and you need the rest to be skew symmetric. So when this is integrable, this is symmetric, and you just have that this is negative or transpose of that. So you don't want to call the whole matrix integrable. That's why I'm a little guarded about using that terminology. The term integrability is reserved for this 1-1 one, one block as I call it. Okay. So, yes. Just to follow up on that, 
So, so, so now, okay, so the first thing is that you notice, so this is why these problems are a little harder. As soon as you rewrite it like this, right, what you notice to get a solution of that game, and it's a primal dual solution because it's a solution in the primal variables. So for those of you who have not studied optimization or haven't seen enough of it, the x decisions are often referred to as primal decisions. The lambda or the multiplier decisions are referred to as dual decisions. If you look at this equilibrium that I referred to here, this was a partial, you know, it was actually in this case a primal dual equilibrium because what I did was I had an ax plus a, a x1 plus bx2 minus b and I had the lambda. So the equilibrium is in x1, x2 and lambda. Okay, so now what you find is that the solution it's not the primal solution that you're trying to get uniqueness for. It's the primal dual solution. And that's much harder. Right? And the reason why it's harder is because you can see that the primal dual solution is a solution to a complementarity problem with a monotone map. This map is almost, if I tell you, if I tell you this is positive semi-definite, then the whole matrix is positive semi-definite. But it can never be positive definite in which case you always lose the, un the ability to prove uniqueness. It may be that, you know, that's, that, you know, it's an idiosyncratic situation where you only find one KKT pair, but it's hard to prove unless you modify this and make this epsilon times identity. You get a nearby solution. Okay. So, um, so this is the part about skew symmetric, right? So if you, if, so, so when you have a situation where you have shared constraints, then one avenue is to use this framework. And what you've done with this framework is you've been able to come up with, you've been able to come up with uh, an equivalent optimization problem. But you have to remember, you don't want to use the term integrability. It's a little different because you're looking for a primal dual pair. And in fact, when we looked at perfectly competitive equilibrium uh, markets, we'll be using this avenue. Because this is an instance of a perfectly competitive. So you remember in perfectly competitive markets, what do you have? Oh no, I won't, I won't do it for this one. Okay. So is this clear? Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you one instance of this problem that is actually important which is perfectly competitive markets. And then I'm going to show you what it looks like in more generality. Okay, so does everybody have this done? So can I erase this? Okay, cool. So I didn't strike me that they wash these sponges. It's a very useful thing. Okay, so in perfectly competitive markets, you have a collection of firms. Each firm has some linear cost, we're going to assume for the timing, and they have some capacity constraint. And you have to meet some exogenous demand requirement. So actually, let's, let's not do it this way, sorry. Um, in, I have to be careful. P times Xi, okay. So the ith player, the ith player can generate at a cost Ci, and whatever he generates is sold at a price P. This is a very simplified problem, okay, but I want to use this to motivate. Okay, so let's, uh, let's do it for each player. Each player has Okay. So now if you look at this problem, 
you might say, well, there's nothing coupling this problem, right? Except the P, which is a parameter. So the P happens to be a price, and the price happens to be the Lagrange multiplier of some exogenous supply-demand constraint. This is the demand. The intuition is that every generator has a capacity. The overall generation has to meet demand. And the sensitivity of this demand, I mean, is, so, so there's this, the, there's this uh, notion of price that corresponds to the Lagrange multiplier of this. But it's, it's not clear what it is sensitive to. And I'll make that apparent when I write down the conditions. So this is what couples these. Okay, so does everybody see the problem? Yes. How can you call it exogenous? Yeah, yeah. So it's exogenous because it's imposed outside these problems. It says, I want a collection of solutions such that they all satisfy this. Now you might say, well, how is that possible? Because when I optimize this, I get a solution, right? That's why I need to jointly solve this. So the point is that that's why you can't solve this in isolation. And I'm going to show you that basically when you if you pick the P in a sensible fashion, then you get exactly this requirement. Okay. So the first thing you do, the first thing you do is you write down the optimality conditions. Right? So if you wrote down the optimality conditions of the of this problem, what do you get? You get zero is le uh, sorry, uh, yeah. C one minus P. And let's assume these are. Lagrange multipliers are lambda 1. And this is for this constraint, okay, lambda n. Um, so you get plus lambda 1. What you also get is Yeah, yeah, but this one, the way it works is, so if you remember, when we had this, what I started doing was I started dropping one because it, it amounts to the same. So suppose I gave you this problem. Suppose I said x less than capacity, x greater than 0, and I make this lambda and u. If I write down the KKT conditions, I get gradient of f plus lambda minus u equals 0. I get lambda is orthogonal to cap minus x. And I get u is orthogonal to x non-negative. But look what u is. u is exactly this. So I can eliminate u and just substitute it here. OK? What kind of Nash? Is it Nash or generalized Nash now? So, so in this case, so in this case, it's a, I call this constrained. It's, 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 it's kind of a weird situation where the price, so if you look at perfectly competitive, so this is a perfectly competitive situation, the constraint is outside. I haven't imposed it inside yet, right? But you can copy it inside. You so could, I mean, there are different ways to do it. But what I'm going to show you is in this case, I can write it completely as single optimization problem. Yeah, I agree. But yeah. This setup, we don't have a name for that, saying it's Nash or generalized. I don't call it generalized Nash because at least as it stands, the constraint is not inside. Yeah. Right? I could put it inside and make it generalized Nash. Yeah. But I, I like to keep it outside because it's an exogenous constraint. It, it depends, yeah. Yes. If I remember right, we had seen on Monday. Exactly. 
individual optimization problem. Yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you it comes down to a single optimization problem. No, no, the price setter. I mean, we can the have price setter, yeah, yeah, you can do that as well. So what I can do is uh, I can rewrite this as P times, is this, is this what you meant? Yeah, we can do that. I, I don't want to do that yet because it adds more machinery. I don't want to, I just want to show you the simple step first. Because once I, so I'll do that the next step, but before that I just want to show you that I can get a single optimization problem. But that's, what's, what's your name? Uh, Nicholas. Nicholas, okay. So that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, and the reason I do that versus making a generalized Nash is because then that says pure Nash. Okay, anyway. So now that we're here, we have one more constraint, which is this one. Right, this is the last constraint. So uh, summation... I don't know where to put it, but whatever. We have summation of xi minus d equals 0 and p is free. Now, what you notice is that these are exactly the optimality conditions of this problem. So this is called the perfectly competitive problem. And the reason why I want to show you this is because for this class of problems, the analysis reduces to just understanding the properties of this problem. And this is a very well studied I mean, this is a linear program. So if you want to show existence, right, existence of this follows immediately if the feasible region is non-empty. And, and uh, yeah, it's not empty. So um, the um, uniqueness, of course, of this is much harder, right? Because it's a linear program. We know that linear programs routinely have multiple solutions. So the best you can often do in this, unless you add a regular li regularizer like this, is that you're going to get non-unique solutions. Now, if you add this, you'll get unique solutions. Okay. So the reason I did this was to just show you that the analysis of perfectly competitive markets can be reduced to this problem. Now, when you add a network generator, all of that stuff, it just becomes a little more elaborate, but the problem stays the same. Sorry. So here, when you add this regularization, epsilon, it's exactly yeah. Yeah. Because if you don't do it for all of them, what happens is that it might be strongly convex in some space, but yeah. not in the whole space. It means that they have consensus on uh, the value of epsilon. Otherwise, again, it's not unique. It's not unique anyway. yeah. So you're saying, uh, so uh, you're right. I mean, I could make an epsilon i. doesn't matter. I'm just trying to get a unique solution. But remember, any unique solution is parameterized by this epsilon i. So you're saying with epsilon i, it's still unique, the solution. Oh, no, it's unique for any epsilon, right? But the point is that should you set the same epsilon or different epsilon, doesn't matter because the epsilon in any case is arbitrary, right? Okay. So, I mean, whether you agree on it or not, it is still arbitrary, right? So the equilibrium that you get, unique or otherwise, is still a it's still dependent on the epsilon. You can't get away from that. Yes, uh, Vladimir? You want the steps of that? Yeah. yeah, okay. So this is just by writing out the KKT conditions. So you write out the KKT conditions of this. So if you write down the KKT conditions of this without this, what you get is, so you get exactly that. You get Xi is orthogonal to because this is separable, right? And the, Lagra and the Lagrange multiplier is lambda. What you're going to get is ci plus lambda i minus p is greater than zero. Lambda i is orthogonal to uh, minus xi plus cap i uh, greater than zero. And 
And here you just get P is orthogonal to summation of x i minus d equals 0. Now, how did I conclude that I could write it like this by using skew symmetry? Because look at this problem. If you wrote down the if you wrote down this KKT system, you'd find that this is of this form. This is x1, xn, lambda 1, lambda n, and p. And what you notice is this lies in some cone, some cone. This is equal this is orthogonal to some mapping. So what I want to show you is actually the Jacobian of this mapping. The Jacobian of this mapping is given by is given by the zero matrix, the identity matrix negative E uh, yeah. Um, Next one is uh, one second identity negative identity. Where does this come from? This comes so this is basically comes from the following. If I take f of x lambda p, that mapping is This is Jacobian of F. That mapping is C1 minus, uh, so I'll, I'll write it in general form. It's C minus P times E, E is the column of ones plus lambda. Uh, cap, which is a vector of capacities, minus X, and E transpose X minus D. So this is important. I want to make sure that everybody understands how I reached here. I have just written this in using the, the vector structure. So if C1 minus P, C2 minus P all the way C n minus P. If I treat C as a vector, I get C and P is repeated. So it is P times the column of ones. So I have just written it like that C minus P times the column of ones plus lambda which is a vector. Okay. Vladimir, clear? Emily? This is cap, the vector, minus x, the vector of decisions. E transpose x is just a summation, minus d. Now, if you take the Jacobian of that, you're left with differentiate in x, you get 0. Differentiate in lambda, you get the identity. If you differentiate in p, you just get minus e. If you differentiate in x, you get negative identity, and it's independent of everything else, so it's 0, 0. Differentiate in x, you get E transpose, 0, 0. Now you can see it's this block which corresponds to primal variables is 0. But what you need is that block has to be symmetric. So even if I had something there, I could still deal with it as long as it was symmetric. And the rest of this you need skew symmetry. So this has to be the negative of the transpose of that. And when that happens, I can then rewrite it as the KKT conditions of some constraint problem. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, just for clarity, sometimes you write the f as a function of only primal variables, x. Yeah. Sometimes you write as primal and dual. Is, is and the reason, yeah. yeah, the reason why I move to the primal dual is because in this case, if you there is a shared structure, whether it's outside or whether it's explicit, there's a shared structure. And I need to use the prices or the multipliers in some way. As a consequence, I move in the complementarity space and I write the mapping in the full space. But if you wrote as a price setter, then you could write just as a map on primal variables, right? Because the price is primal variables. So if, uh, if you wrote that, you would, but, but essentially you have a similar set of conditions that show up. Because even if you did that, suppose you, you, if you wrote, so is your point, and this is the point later what Nicholas said, that if you put it like this, yep. but even if you do this, P is primal variable. in this case P is a primal variable, but remember what's happening, this is motivated by a dual setting. So even if you write it, you get the same conditions. Nothing. Yeah, yeah, but in writing the, in the, the map, uh, map F, 
Yeah. You can get yourself lambda. Then. No, the lambda comes from the capacity constraints, right? Yeah, yeah, but you can write the map just for objective functions, not for the constraint anymore, right? Um, oh, I see what you're saying. So if you are, uh, so, so what you're saying is that you basically relax all these constraints. Because if you want to get rid of the thing in lambda, you'll have to write this as minus lambda 1 times capacity 1 minus x1. And then you need to write another minimize lambda. But remember, when you do that, now you have to make sure that lambda has to be non-negative. So it comes down to the same thing. You're not going to be able to get away with it because the lambda is, is a dual variable in this case. So the price is also, in some sense, a dualizing variable. As a consequence, you, it, it shows up in this q symmet in this part, not in the primal part. Okay. Yes, Alifia. Also, for example, keeping the price outside makes it easier, right? To, because if we would put the price inside everybody's optimization problem, it means everybody knows, have to know what everybody else is doing. So when you say put the price in, how do you, what do you mean by that? Do you mean put summation of x minus d equals? So if you did that, if you did that, you can still do it, but the way you have to do it is everybody has to agree on the price. It comes down to the same thing. It comes down to the same thing. Okay. So Nicholas, did I answer your question? So if you make it into a price setter, well, sorry, the, the, the pricing as a price setter, as an explicit agent, same thing. Because when you write the KKT conditions, again, the same thing shows up. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, once we, uh, I, I understand now how you write the F and the F, but then how do you write the objective function? So the objective function in, uh, in the case of this guy? Yes. So this one comes from integrating this chap here. Okay. Right? In this case now, it, it's actually, uh, now you, you have to obviously... Uh, Look at it from the mapping. The Hessian, the, this won't tell you because you basically, in you know, differentiated it. So once you're here, you have to see it, right? Because when you're here, you realize that basically this part corresponds to the these variables. The only thing that has appeared without with, which is after the differentiation of x, is this guy here. So it becomes c times x. So you're saying that the primal part is symmetric. The other part, the dual part, is. Skew symmetric. Skew symmetric, yeah. So we can write a position. Yeah. So I mean the matrix, the system is skew symmetric, yeah. but within this, so what you need is if this is, so if this is uh, symmetric, then this can be viewed as the Hessian of some objective, right? So I can still do that. Other questions? Okay. So now what I'm going to do? Sorry. Yes. I, I kind of missed that point when you said about regularization term for that objective. Yeah. So, so when I put a regularization term, if I need uniqueness, I can just pick some epsilon. If you want a unique epsilon for each player, you can do so. But whatever you pick, it doesn't, the, the issue is still, the issue is that this is still some arbitrary parameter. The equilibrium you get is dependent on the choice of epsilon. If you pick a common one, you pick a common, I mean, the thing is that it's still arbitrary. So it's either arbitrarily chosen as exact, I mean, identical for everyone or it's arbitrarily, you know, it's just an, a random, random small number. But, but with the linear cost that we have now, we can have equilibrium, but there's of course multiple equilibrium. There might be multiple, yeah. But maybe they can choose epsilon smartly to get the better payout. So, so um, if you start getting into that, the thing is that when you start choosing the epsilons, huh? the point is that you have to give them only a threshold, right? If you give them too much, then the equilibrium is going to change drastically. So if you said, now suppose you say epsilon is within, um, you know, zero and some small epsilon, then maybe you might have some sort of prisoner's dilemma type effect. One of them cho chooses that everybody else. So again, it gets into another. So I feel like that basically will get you into another, <laughs> an infinite loop of these things. So I, I think that's not so worrisome. I think you choose it and say this is this is close to one of the, you know, to the set of equilibria. And the good thing is that you might be able to get bounds on it. But still, I mean, I think it just reflects how difficult the problem is. Um, I'm just going to get a bottle of water.
now I think we've reached the point where we can actually talk about some of the theory. Right, let's 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 try and take a crack at some of these these questions. Start right, because I didn't do anything. Other, oh, it's there. Okay, I was wondering whether if I did something wrong. Oh, okay, that's a good idea. Okay. Okay. So let's try and go through these now. Is that okay? Hey, do you? Yeah, I just forgot mine and you know you leave I I apologize, I should have gotten from there and I forgot to. You'd think with thirty five hours or whatever of this I'd I'd remember to get it's probably the more more important than clothes, right? Oh sorry. Uh, So Anubhav, is this an Apple product, this this little attachment? Yeah. It is? Okay. Yeah. They're running their scam quite a bit, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Elaborate scam. <laughs> so anyway. Okay. So now we've been looking at fixed point arguments for the more challenging non-integrable settings, right? Where we're trying to examine whether equilibria emerge. Um, and so there's been a lot of work in terms of establishing existence using players' response maps. Uh, and this is particularly uh, difficult when the variables are not explicitly bounded. You know, when you have transmission fees, you have prices. Uh, and so there's been a lot of effort through finite dimensional variation and inequality theory uh, to provide a, a framework for the successful analysis and solution of these problems. Right? So now I'm going to provide you with refined results in the current setting, the setting that we have. Right? So if you remember last time, uh, or, or two lectures ago, we had this problem. And in this type of problem, we essentially, we had uh, a firm F, uh, which was generating at, at node I, that was its capacity, and this was the sales level. These were the transmission limits, and we eliminate them to come up with these, these, uh, these constraints. And what we found was that basically these were the constraints of this centralized problem, right? So a necessary and sufficient condition for the existence of a perfectly competitive equilibrium is just that I want that this feasible region be non-empty. That's it. Why is that? Just from linear programming theory. If you have an optimization problem which is linear, all you need is I want a feasible, I need a feasible solution. If I can get a feasible solution, I can go ahead. Okay. Uh, and so, so the question for you is, can I find a feasible solution to this set of constraints? It's not difficult. You know, you can, if I gave you a very complicated set of constraints, for you to go and find a feasible solution, you can just solve, just solve a linear program and see whether the linear program provides you with. So what you do is, just so that you know exactly, so I don't want to give you something and you don't know how to actually check for feasibility. The way to check for feasibility for a complicated setting like this is so my, the question that, that, that is raised is find x bar such that ax bar is non-negative. Oh, is that greater than, so just something that satisfies that system. How do you solve that? Let me just solve this convex optimization problem. Just a, supply it to a standard solver like Linprog in MATLAB, any solver. If it exits with an optimal value 0 with an x bar, you're done. And it's guaranteed to find one if one exists. Okay? And it's guaranteed to do so in polynomial time. Right? So it's an easy problem. So one thing you always have to keep an eye on 
is if somebody gives you an existence condition where evaluating the condition is as hard as solving the original problem, then you know it's a bit hokey, right? So one of the things you have to keep pushing both me and other people is how easy is it for me to verify this, right? So you always have to keep asking that question because otherwise if it's not, it pushes people who work on theory to do it or at least it tests them and says, hey, is your condition actually useful? There's no point in me giving you a condition which actually requires you to go and solve an NP hard problem and evaluate that to determine existence. That's far too much, right? So I think something's happened in my slideshow. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so this is the first result. Now, how did, I, how did I come up with this? Well, you took the optimality conditions. Just as we took the optimality conditions for this problem, this is the problem that I, I, I specified in the first lecture. This was the optimization problem. You just compare the KKT conditions. You find that it's equivalent to this single problem. Thing, uh, Priyanka asked me, how do you do that? You just compare the KKT conditions and you look. Say, oh, this is exactly this. And, and the test is, if you lose this Q-symmetric structure, you know you're already in trouble. Don't waste your time. Okay? And now, all you need to do is that this thing has a, has a non-empty compact polyhedral region. So it has an optimal solution, if and only if it is feasible. Right? And the latter feasibility is the condition stipulated. Okay? So does everybody see how to establish existence of a perfectly competitive equilibrium? Any questions? Uh, are, we, are we using feasibility and existence interchangeably? So it's, it's necessary and sufficient now because if it's feasible, mm -hmm. I can get an optimal solution. And if I can get an optimal so solution, that's an equilibrium. So it's if and only if. And if it's optimal, it is feasible. So, Okay. Now, remember I had the unified model. In the unified model, I essentially had it captured Nash Cournot and some other things, which I don't want to waste time on, but Nash Cournot was definitely there, right? Now, uh, I, had a I can actually deal with shared constraints, but I don't want to do that now. So just drop, ignore this part, because when I did this, I wrote this part out as well. Now, it turns out that for the shared constraint model, remember in the shared constraint model what I had? I had a collection of players and I had a collection of feasible regions, right? So. How, how do we go about that? Well, the way to go about that is, uh, let me just show you one thing. Uh, we don't know if the game is integrable to begin with, right? So what we do is we say, well, what I want to do is if I can write down the variational inequality, now that variational inequality is what? It's basically going to take the Cartesian product of all those feasible sets, get the set, and then get the, the F mapping, two objects. The first, so then to get existence, remember what conditions did we use? I think I've erased them, but the conditions we used were, is X compact, non-empty, convex, and is F continuous? So the first thing is, is X, I think I can show compactness. How do we show compactness? So the first thing that you notice is that in this particular case, for the setting that we had, we had capacity constraints on... Uh, on generation, I can construct a bound on sales because the aggregate sales cannot be cannot exceed aggregate capacity. So sometimes what happens is your problem may not have an explicit bound, but you recognize that a bound can be introduced without changing the solution. And that's something that you as a modeler will have to get used to. Right? So the problem is inherently bounded, but you just haven't explicitly imposed those bounds. Did you see what I'm saying? If you're generating electricity and you're selling it, there's a bound on generation. There's no explicit bound on sales. But you'll never sell more, as in the, the aggregate sales cannot exceed aggregate capacity. So which means aggregate sales are bounded, which means your sales are also bounded. Okay? And that's the bound. You have a conservation constraint at each, uh, each firm, where the amount you generate is equal to the amount you sell. And then you have a constraint on the flow on a transmission line, and you've eliminated one of those variables 
just to the y variables we had. So, you can just introduce these PTDF type constraints. Okay. So, now look at this S is bounded, G is bounded. So, this polyhedral set can be viewed as a bounded region. Okay. But there are more variables here, right? What are the other variables here? The other variables here are the prices. Okay. So, prices are problematic. In general, prices are not bounded and it causes problems. So, in this particular setting, if you think about the prices that we have, I am going to assume that the price function qi of pi. So, now qi of pi, so remember what the price function, the price function depends on the aggregate sales and it is p of some q. If you invert it and you assume that it is a one dimensional invertible function, then you have qi of pi. So, I make the assumption and this is not a stringent assumption, that qi of pi is a decreasing function in price. So, the quantity decreases with the, with the price. Okay. Now, if you have that, then you know that you can, so what you have is that you can, you can uh, we have to make an assumption that P underscore I and P over bar I are um, bound QI inverse from above and below. And this relationship, oh no, I can't take this down. Okay. Um, this comes from the strictly decreasing nature and this comes from the bound that I impose. Okay. So, now remember the market clearing condition. right? In the case where this is Nicholas's point, you can look at this as the simple case and perfectly competitive or the more general case is just this. Okay. Now, this what I am going to do is I am going to impose this bound here. You see this? In reality, this bound does not exist. But once I make an assumption that the price function satisfies this, when I impose this bound, I have to prove that this is still the solution of the unconstrained problem, that the bound does not change the solution. If the bound changes the solution, then the bound is actually affecting the equilibrium. And if it is affecting the equilibrium, that is not, that's not, you know, not allowed. Right? So, what do we, how do we show that? Well, the way we show that is we write down the optimality conditions for this problem. Right? So, we claim that this constrained problem is equal to its unconstrained version for all SI, for any, you know. So, any optimal solution must lie strictly in the bounds, in the interior. So, the bounds are never active. Okay? So, first write down the optimality conditions for this, assuming that one of the bounds is there. Right? So, what I am going to do is basically, I am going to write this out. So, we have p i star minus p bar i is greater than or equal to 0 and uh, so these are the complementarity constraints for, for each of the bounds. Okay, so, this is lambda i and this is the other one and I am just looking at one of the bounds here. So, if you differentiate this, what do you get? S i, you are differentiating this integral, this is from uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus, what you get is q i times p i star plus lambda i that corresponds to one of these bounds. I am only looking at this bound here and you can do the same thing for the other bound. Now, I start by assuming that the optimal solution is at the bound because if it is at the bound, then I know that the bound has actually led to the solution. Okay? So, I assume that the optimal solution is at the bound, but if it is at the bound, what happens is and I, 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 here I do not want to go into details because I think this is a little, it is a little heavy, it is not, and it is not entirely necessary. I want you to kind of see it, but I do not want you to have to obsess over it. What you can see is that you, you can actually derive a contradiction if you show this, right. And so, what happens is based on that contradiction, you can claim that P i actually lies in the interior, okay. Similarly, so you can choose it at either bound, lower bound or upper bound. In either case, you can show that this condition is satisfied with equality. When it is satisfied with equality, it, you find that qi of pi star is this value which exceeds si, but we know it has to be less than si. So, you can derive a contradiction with the assumed properties of qi pi. Okay? So, for those of you wondering, well, how does this affect us? Well, the reason it affects us is because of this last claim, I can impose these bounds when they are carefully chosen 
and it doesn't affect the solution of the problem. But what it does is it makes the pricing problem compact. And what that does is it allows us to claim existence. Okay, so does everybody understand what I've done? I knew that the primal variables were bounded. So that was cool. The pricing variables were not bounded to begin with. However, by making an assumption on the type of pricing function, I was able to show that I could introduce artificial bounds. And these artificial bounds are never satisfied. It's like somebody tells you that I know it's not bounded. Just if you put a bound of a minus 100,000 and plus 100,000 and you guarantee that it never reaches those bounds, then the problem immediately becomes nice. But the key is to show that it never reaches those bounds. Okay, and if you're not able to show that, then what you're doing is not kosher, right? Okay. Yes. You have another I mean, option that if it's not compact, still yeah. we can check. Yeah, yeah. Right. So why don't we use this so, and try to put bounds on the price? So here we haven't put bounds on the price. We are saying that we made an assumption on the price, right? So I could do that as well. I've chosen this because we're looking at our, at least in this work, we're trying to come up with a unified structure to capture everything. If I do that, what happens is that it's difficult to get a single assumption that works for everything. Okay. But that is clearly another way. And that is, that is, that avenue can be adopted for more stylized problems. If you want something more general, a general theory, then you can just say, does, you know, does your market satisfy this? If it does, I directly get existence. Right? I want to give people a recipe which they can use without worrying too much. So, uh, is there any way to use this uh, with price in in elasticity of demand? Not decreasing as you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't think so. Yeah, I'm not sure if I can. So, so, it can, so, so one thing is that it can deal with the perfectly competitive structure, but that doesn't capture yours. Um, but it can't deal with this. Yeah, no, that is, no, I can't. Okay. Um, now, but there's still one thing remaining, right? One thing that is remaining is, um, so this is the existence result. Now, each cost function was convex. Each QI PI is non-increasing, right? What we need is this function. So remember this function. This function, when it's Cournot, is just P of S, right? It's just the, uh, the price from the sales. And I, we've generalized it to something called rho FI. And why have we done that? So I'm, I haven't made that clear. The reason I've done that is that we have this other framework called conjectured supply functions, which we can also deal with. But I don't want to unload that theory on you. But needless to say, this can deal with perfectly competitive and Nash Kurno. And it can also deal with Nash Kurno, as I show you, with uh, nonlinear demand. So once you have this, this is the gradient map. Okay. And, and now I don't waste my time trying to see is this integrable or not. I can directly see that this is a continuous mapping and the set is a compact set. Why is it compact? Because X is compact and now this is a closed and bounded interval. So which means that this variational inequality problem has a solution. Okay. Yeah. Oh, no, no, I don't have that here. It's there in, uh, so th there are other models. So currently, what models have we looked at? We've looked at perfectly competitive and we've looked at Nash Kurno. There is another one called conjectured supply functions, which is beyond the scope of this class. Our goal in writing this, doing this work, this is also part of research, is to develop a price, uh, a framework which works for everything, right? How many of you have watched Lord of Rings? Have you guys watched Lord of Rings? So this is like, a model to rule all models, okay? So, uh, so then what you have is, so if you want to do a uniqueness, so all I did here was just write down the VI, there's nothing else here. Okay, so the uniqueness analysis, still problematic. We don't have an answer to this. All that we have is, we have two avenues. One avenue is that if you have some nice structure, you can write this problem as, uh, as an optimization problem and you regularize this. Now, if the cost function in generation cost is strictly convex, we don't need to regularize that, but we do need to regularize sales. Okay? And what we do is, so once we have that, we have to, we need a suitable regularity condition, but otherwise we basically just 
you know, we basically show equivalence between this and a convex optimization problem. So we need some integral, you know, we need some structure in the price function for that. So this is case one when there's some structure like this exists, but clearly such a structure doesn't always exist, right? It exists when you have affine Nash Cournot, right? When the price function in Cournot is affine, but in Cournot games, you know that the price function could be nonlinear, and I'll talk about that next. Okay, so in this case, you have uniqueness. You also now here's the other interesting thing. And this is something that I glossed over yesterday when we were talking, right? So when you're looking for a solution, you also want a unique primal dual solution, right? So now if I give you a unique primal solution, when do you get unique multipliers? So if you have a regularity condition like uh, linear independence constraint qualification, then the multipliers are unique, okay? So there are some conditions. On, but again, if you want to assume that, that regularity condition says something about the gradients of the objective at the at the equilibrium right it's it's an unverifiable condition optimizers use it routinely because we need it for algorithm design but in your case it's you know it's a bit hokey cuz how would you check if this condition holds at an equilibrium when you don't know what the equilibrium is so i'm pointing out th there is some there is some circularity in this right you don't like conditions which require you to no, have knowledge about the type of equilibrium before you evaluate them, but that's the best we can do in optimization. Okay. Bef I mean, if you particularly if you're working in the primal dual world. Okay. Now let's look at a special case. If it's a nash cournot equilibrium, where you have this price function. So this is a special case of that. Cost functions are strictly convex. This mapping can be shown to be a strictly monotone map. Right, and so this is straightforward. It just requires showing that this is, or oh, this, there's a term missing. Here. This is a positive definite matrix, because a positive matrix means something else. It's a positive definite matrix. Okay. Um, okay. I don't want to do P naught yet. Okay, I'll go back into it. Okay, so now I'm going to just talk about the most general case, which is actually a, a relatively harder case. Um, which time do we have? Okay. Um, so remember now we had the generators where we eliminated the Y decisions corresponding to transmission flows, right? And now what we've done is we've relaxed. So this was the generator problem and you know the optimization problem that I had. So and, and uh, Jalal was just saying this, right? I can relax all constraints and add multipliers as price setters, right? So this was the the optimization problem and I've relaxed all of these okay and now I've got these are all and now I can write down the variational inequality in the full space right in the space of multipliers and in the space of primal variables now look what happens essentially what happens is all of these are over zero infinity so they're clearly unbounded okay so they're clearly unbounded so the first thing is what have I done I've taken the optimization uh, or the variational problem and I basically relaxed the constraints and put the, the Lagrange multipliers as the um, solution to, the, to, to a price setting problem. Okay. Now this is a variational inequality where k hat is a rectangle. Why do I say it's a rectangle? Because there's nothing that links these. Look at the, the constraints. This is non-negative. This is non-negative. This is the real line and G i and F i are just sets. So there's no coupling in these strategy sets across players. So this is a non, you know, it's a pure Nash game. Okay. It's a pure Nash game. So now, so this gets a little hairy that, uh, and, and the reason why I wanted to do it, you can blame Jalal for this. He said, we should have a real example, which captures this. It's a little nastier. But the hope is you see a nasty example, you can solve somewhat easier example, right? So the idea, the first thing you need to do is you need to sit and compute the overall map. So these are the gradients of each of the players. These are the gradients associated with um, the pricing problem, lambda plus and lambda minus. And this is the gradient associated with the eta problem. 
So before I move ahead, I want to make sure everybody understands this. Right? We need to make sure that we all grasp why we reached here. We reached here because I took the gradient of the objective of this, 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 this and concatenated it. Okay? So if I take the gradient of that, I get F1 to Fn for the n generators. See, this is generators 1 to n. And then if I, if I take the gradient of the lambda plus and lambda minus problem, that's what I get. And the eta problem, that's what I get. Now, each of the Fi's, if I differentiate, look, I get the, the derivative of in cost. And then I get this. This is the sales gradients. Okay. And similarly, I get... Now, what you notice is, and you'll start seeing this after a while. If you look at this map, you can start seeing that this map is nearly integrable. Right? If I take the Jacobian of this, it's going to be skew-symmetric. Uh, sorry, symmetric, actually, in this case. And why is that? And the reason is, what, what's, what might stop it? Well, this. We don't know what this function is. If this function is affine, then the gradient is a constant, and everything is fine. If it's not affine, then we're in trouble. Okay? And that's the concern I'm going to deal with. So does everybody, is everybody with me at this juncture? Okay. So then the Jacobian of this map is going to be compactly stated in this form. Right? So I've basically taken each of these. Right? And so that's the, the Jacobian in X and uh, beta, where beta represents, um, so this is, where is the beta? Right now, the beta. Uh, I think beta just represents the sales or something. I'm trying to remember what I did with the beta. It's just a variable that I've used there. Okay. Anyway, so that's the Jacobian. It has that structure. Um, look at this. This is the Hessian for the cost, the Hessian for the sales. Normally, the sales, it's an affine Nash Kuno. This is zero. This term doesn't show up. Okay. And this is a constant. If P of S, so just so that everybody is with me, if P of S in standard Cournot is A minus B S, then P prime of S is minus B and P double prime of S is zero. But the problem is that I could have some nonlinear function where P, where P prime of S is not equal to a constant and p double prime of s is not equal to 0. I could have that, right? And so the thing is, how do you deal with that? So hold on for a second. Let's, let's go through this. These AI matrices come from the PTDFs, right? So it's a fairly kind of elaborate matrix structure, OK? So the first thing I'm going to show you is that this mapping is a P-naught map, because I want to show uniqueness. What is a B0 map? And so here I'm going to talk about that. A P0 map is a map where if you take the Jacobian of that map, then every principal minor is non-negative. So what is a principal minor? So essentially, and I, I, when I go through this, you'll understand. The principal minors correspond to taking sub-matrices and showing that these sub-matrices have non-negative determinants. Okay, so if you remember the determinant of a two by two matrix, um, so this brings back the glorious memories of your high school days, which for you guys was yesterday, right? Is it the same as to say that it's positive semi No. Oh, so so wait, wait. The thing is that if it's positive definite, this holds, but it's this is weaker, right? So. So if I gave you a matrix, so if I gave you a matrix A, say I gave you this matrix, 3, 1, 2, 6, right? So what, if you want the principal minors of A, you need to take every principal submatrix. So the first submatrix is this one. So clearly the determinant of 3 is 3, so which is positive. 
and then you take this sub matrix which is 3, 1, 2, 6. The determinant of that is 18 minus 2, which is 4. Okay. So principal sub matrices. Okay. Um, so now the principal minors of M. Now you need to sh what did I make a mistake in the first? 3, 6 or 18. Oh, no, 4, sorry. 18 minus 2, 16, sorry. Um, so I need to show the principal minors are uh, non-negative. And it's a painful process because you need to deal with index sets that span from one to all of this. So think about a large matrix, you need to check all these principal minors. Now they have some structure, so it's not completely dead. So you'll see that certain sub matrices all look the same. So if you figure out what happens with one, you figure out with most of them. And there are different clumps of these you need to worry about. Okay. So it's a nasty problem that I like, but I don't have a choice. This is what it takes to deal with showing uniqueness. So now if you look at the first part, this is the Jacobian of Fi, it has this structure. Well, Di of C is just this. Now you can look at this. Diagonal matrices, they're trivially P, not just P, not P. Okay. And Pi tilde has this structure. Now this is actually a very interesting structure, and this structure you can show that it actually is a P naught map and I'll show you how to do that. Okay. And what you have is you have a P naught plus diagonal when you have a matrix. So now you're probably wondering, you know, how do you know this? Well, this is just the more research you do in this, you'll start seeing this. It's hard for me to give you the, fee, the, the background regarding some of these linear algebra uh, requirements. Um, but that's something you'll get as you spend more time. Okay, so what I've shown you now is that look, this matrix is basically this uh, this Jacobian is a matrix like this, and it's actually a constant matrix, barring, assuming that if C is just um, if you just have a linear cost, if you have a quadratic cost, it's still it's still constant, and if you have a nonlinear cost, like something which is cubic or quartic, then it's nonlinear there. Okay, but it's still diagonal. Okay, it's still diagonal. Okay, so once you have this, now what you need to do is the psi that you have is the index set. What is the index set? When I have a matrix like this, I need to construct, take some of these submatrix. The psi specifies which indices I'm going to worry about. Okay, so if I'm interested in the first four, I'm going to check these, but I need to check all of these, all possibilities, as long as they're principal, right? So I can't, for instance, check this submatrix. That's not real. That's not a principal submatrix. Okay. So then, I check. I look at subsets n x times n plus one from n x times n plus n beta. It turns out that submatrix is zero. So it's a p zero matrix. I check another, the other one, which is goes from nx times n plus 1 to nx times n times beta. This can be looked at two non-intersecting index sets and you get essentially this. Now, this one turns out to be a P0 matrix. This is a zero matrix, right? And so then you go through this exhaustively. There's just, I mean, I wish there was some cool intuition. It's just pain and more pain. I mean, there's nothing else. To do. It's just, I mean, this is just... Um, and so once you go through it, all of it, you're able to then show that the overall matrix is, uh, is a P0 matrix. So you've been asking me about how to deal with uniqueness. Now, this still doesn't give you uniqueness. If it's P, it's uniqueness. If it's P0, it says that basically you can regularize it and get a unique solution. Okay, so it goes on for a bit. So, so what you can claim from this is that basically this, when you have strict convexity and you have these properties that the price function now look the price function this is no longer zero it could be less than zero so the price function is decreasing but it's nonlinear as long as it you make sure that it satisfies some concavity prop property the price function then you're able to get a, a uniqueness for the regularized problem again remember it's regularized i don't have it for the or original problem right now, there is this theory of epsilon Nash, which means that basically you can show that for every slight modification, an equilibrium exists. Now, the term epsilon Nash should be used carefully. 
some people look at term epsilon Nash as an equilibrium which is within epsilon of the true Nash equilibrium. Others say that if you modify the problem by epsilon, that gives you an equilibrium. So I think the true version is what the economists say, which is epsilon away. We don't have an epsilon Nash. That's why I don't call it epsilon Nash. Okay. So remember, the main difference is that the price function here is nonlinear, so you cannot rewrite this as an optimization problem. So the framework we used before will not work. What you need to do is analyze the map. And we know for a fact this map isn't monotone. We can see it. It's not monotone. So the only avenue is to use the P0 structure. Okay. So I know this was a lot of fairly heavy, but I didn't, uh, hopefully I didn't kind of bore you too much with this because I feel like you want to leave with the ability to understand what's happened. And if you really need to get into the details, you can always come back to this material. Right? But you need to understand the, bare, the, the, the basic approach okay? and, and how to think about these problems. Okay? So that's what I had for... I'm sorry, I went a little slower. I was hoping to do a little, but I apologize. But I, I felt like it would be good to invest a little more time today to give you, uh, you know, another view of this, this framework. Okay. So I'm happy to take more questions. No question. <laughs> yeah. There you go. how you choose the bound on the prices? Yeah, so the, the, the bound on the prices, uh, so this, oh sorry, so this bound on the price comes from the assumption. So I'm assuming that this price function satisfies the structure. So if it satisfies the structure, it turns out that these bounds can be directly employed without affecting the solution. That's not always the case. We prove it's the case for this framework. OK? Yes? I guess as I mean, as a cap for price, we can just use value of last log. I mean, because if the price goes over that, we can just shut the log. I think that's true for if that's your modeling assumption. I'm not using, we're trying to work in a general framework where I don't have any kind of you know, assumption on this. You're right in the electricity market setting, but I'm looking at general markets where but there may be no, no explicit avenue for imposing that. I think it's fair. You, you understand what I'm saying? If I look at general markets, I cannot impose that. So I'd rather just make an assumption. And if you feel like you can use your assumption for your setting, great. Right. When you define value of that slope, you implicitly means that the cap on price. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I no, mean, no, but in my case, the thing is that the, the price over which you will not buy anyway. I know, but the price could hit the that cap, right? So if you raise the cap and you solve the problem, it, it might hit hit a higher price. In this case, it doesn't reach the bound. I show that the bound is never reached. In your case, is it true that the bound could be reached? If there isn't enough capacity, it could be reached, right? No, no, but if demand shoots up and there isn't enough capacity, it could be that the price starts going towards it, right? If you choose it, but you don't know what that high should be. <laughs> so the thing is that the, the problem is that I don't know, like for instance, in Illinois, I think in 2006, the price, prices went up to, I don't know, like $25,000 per, you know, so what is it that, it's, it's, the point is not to just, we're not doing this from a, for a numerical requirement, right? The point is that if you have a bound, and if the price could reach that bound, then that bound isn't the right bound because it affects the equilibrium. The whole point, the reason we're doing this is you're imposing a bound that is never reached. It's like somebody telling you that, look, I, I don't know what the capacity constraint is, but I know, you know, I can guarantee that you will never reach 100,000. I can guarantee that before, but you can't guarantee that because you don't know how the market. So in this case, because I made an assumption, I can show the bound is never reached. See, when I say the bound is reached, it leads to a contradiction. So, which means the bound is never reached. 
right. Now the question is that if you impose a bound or assume you impose your bound, the question is can there be solutions where the bound is reached? And if there are solutions where the bound is reached, then the choice of that bound influences the equilibrium. In which case, that's problematic, right? Now, there are markets where you impose the cap, right? Zhongxi and Ben had this paper on, on imposing a price cap. If that's part of your market, great. The boundedness comes from the model. But you don't want to introduce boundedness as a means to get an equilibrium. I think that's problematic. Right? You, you want to come extricate boundedness either from the underlying structure, uh, but not impose it. If you impose it, then it's a different problem. Did you see my point, Hassan? Other questions? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no? You spoke about the, the P0 map. Yes. Can you say? Yeah, so the P0 map is basically a map where the Jacobian of the map has positive, non-negative principal minus, non-negative, the Jacobian of the map, so what that means, let me write it down. So F is a P naught map. If is a P naught matrix and the P naught matrix is one with positive principal minus oh sorry non negative principal I keep saying positive principal minus and if you have a variational inequality problem V i x f where f is P and x is a rectangle. What do I mean by rectangle? I mean that basically you don't have, you can write it as a Cartesian product. That implies that it has at most one solution. So if a solution exists, it's unique. So that's that's it's it's a class of matrices. It's just called a P naught matrix. Is it P naught? How do you write? P zero. This is P naught. Oh, I say P naught as in this is naught as in zero. P zero matrix. So naught as in uh, for whatever reason, in English they often uh, sometimes people use naught as in N O U G H T. Oh, the P map is basically so the P map. So if I said a if I said P, this would be P and this would be positive. Okay. But now you're assuming that it's a half strength problem, right? Because you're jacking a map only depends on X. Yeah, so no, no, so it's exact, it's not an unconstrained, I mean, you have, what, what do you mean? So, so Jacobian matrix depends on X. Lambda. No, no, but that, I, I just mean Z. I mean, some, uh, so you could write the primal dual problem. And it could be x comma lambda. I just written as x because I'm assuming the variational inequality problem is defined on x. But x is not the, just the primal variable, it's the full space of variables. So when I look at primal dual problems, x lambda can be written as z. This could all be z, right, the full space. In fact, that's what I did there, right? I looked at z. Yes. Um, this technique, we see it in an HAP grim where all the players are on the same footstep. Uh -huh. So I'll talk about Stack Stackelberg hopefully tomorrow. I've got all the. Uh, so Stackelberg is a little different. I mean, you can use this framework, but existence is very difficult to show because Stackelberg problems lead to non convex optimization problems. So Stackelberg starts with non convex, and it's just, it's very difficult to get, even showing existence of a, no a solution, a global solution to a non convex problem with NP hard. So, uh, so you make this. So you're very lucky. And you are. I mean, sometimes you'll have, for instance, um, you'll have settings where you make very stringent assumptions. And there you can get lots of results. But those are less easy to justify.
Că când îi repita că este... Yeah. yeah, if you have a price cap, then what happens is prices are immediately bounded. Now, there is one problem when you impose a price cap. What does a price cap do? A price cap actually imposes, has a function like this. So, you know the nash Cournot price cap? What is the nash Cournot inverse domain? It looks like this, right? But if you have a price cap, you have something like this and you have a kink. And this kink leads to non-smoothness. So introducing price caps, and if you want to do it correctly, it's mathematically a little more challenging. You don't, I mean, you might say, oh, I get boundedness, but with boundedness comes the scourge of non-smoothness, right? So pick your poison, right? Now, if you explicitly just assume prices are bounded magically, then yeah, then you can, but usually people are going to ask you, how are you enforce, how are you getting them to be bounded? Right? You can't just magically assume that they're bounded. There's something in the price pricing structure that is ensuring boundedness. And usually it's this kind of kink. Okay. And, and is this not also a, like making not a free market anymore? Well, so that's a separate kind of question. I don't want to get yeah. <laughs> that's above my pay grade and beyond my knowledge. Yeah, so I don't wanna So I don't wanna get into that, but I I, I uh, yeah, in, in terms of just mathematically, it's not easy. It's not easy. Well, it's not easy to deal with the non-smoothness. <laughs> the boundedness helps, but the non-smoothness is not. Because what happens with the non-smoothness is, when you try and write first order conditions, now you have the equilibrium conditions, the mapping is not single valued, it's set valued. Because what happens is that essentially the optimization problem is non-smooth. Because each player, Look at this price function. This price function is not a smooth function. So if I take a gradient here, it doesn't exist. Right? So things start getting nasty. I miss um, the explanation. So here oh, you say the, the gradient of big F needs to be symmetric. The blackboard. Oh, wait, which one are you looking at? This at the bottom? Wait, wait. So here we say to be the degraded degraded. Uh, and then we, we add something true symmetry. So, okay. so let, let me, uh, yeah, yeah. So this, this was in the pure Nash game. In this case, I just, uh, the question was, how do you go from the Jacobian of, the, of this map to the actual function that you're trying to optimize? Uh, okay, so what was your question? question is, here we see that it needs to be symmetric. Uh, the, when it's here, it needs to be symmetric. Yeah. We had an example we show and you make a development with, with the gradient of big F. Yeah. It's not symmetric, it's Q symmetric. Q symmetric, yeah. Can, uh, yeah, yeah. So the, the, the thing here is that remember there what happened is so, so uh, when we do it here, we write down the equilibrium conditions in the full space. Right? Now, if you try and directly write this as a, another optimization problem, you cannot do that. You can write it as an optimization problem, but it's a constrained optimization problem. And the solution, not just the primal solution, the dual solution is also necessary to get the equilibrium. Because look, an equilibrium of this problem has both the price and x. Right? So naturally, you expect that if you want a solution to this by solving another optimization problem, it has to be a primal dual solution. And when you're working with primal dual solutions, you have KKT systems and KKT system or these Karush Kuntakar systems and they're always skew symmetric when you write it out. So the skew symmetric structure is something that emerges naturally. No, sorry. The skew symmetric structure emerges naturally. Let me yes. show you how. So for instance, if I gave you a, whenever I give you a convex, constrained convex optimization problem, see I gave you this problem. So the equilibrium conditions of this, if this is lambda, are x lambda orthogonal to q minus a transpose a zero x lambda plus c minus b non-negative. So you can see there's a skew symmetric structure coming in because once you write down the KKT conditions, you always get this 
the skew symmetric structure. Okay. So that is just, you cannot get away from it. And so you might say, why does it show up here and not there? Well, then you never have any multipliers emerging in the discussion. The multipliers emerge here. And the reason they emerge is because you've got some shared structure, you're imposing common multipliers. Once you start doing all that, these skew symmetric structures are just, they're just looming underneath. The, the what? The sto storage. Storage. <laughs> That's a good question. I don't. So if you, you're talking about like grid storage? Okay, so uh, that's, I think Jalal is a better place to answer this. I, I don't, I don't, I haven't modeled storage much. I was, you know, if I had to model storage, how would you model storage? Uh, it's changing what terms? I mean. The optimization problem, how does it change? How does the, how does the firm problem change with storage? It's a good question. How would the firm problem change with storage? So from the standpoint of storage, so I think first of all, so I've done something in this, but it's not quite, maybe to the level of your liking. So the one thing in storage is that you need to deal with multi-period problems because your storage levels at a current level depend on what happened before and how much you can change it by. So I think the optimization problem, if you call the storage variable y, then essentially in consecutive periods, so let's call it t plus 1, is yt plus the amount that you, you charge, which is ct minus the amount you discharge. But now you have a multi-period problem. You can't just take a single period, right? You have to optimize, say, over a day or over two days. So you need to represent this from t from 0 to t minus 1. And now what happens is that this char discharge, I think, and, and you know, Jalal, I, I, you know, Jalal is the expert in, in these things. I don't know as much. But if you look at meeting demand, I expect that you'll get this plus this discharge is equal to some exogenous demand d bar. Right? That could be one way to model it. And then the charging should also show up here. Because if you're charging, then that's also taking in electricity, uh, taking power. So you should be subtracting the amount you charge. You understand? Because if you're charging the storage, that's going to eat into demand, right? If you discharge it, it contributes to, to generation. If you, if you charge, it contributes to demand. So I think the conservation constraint will change. Is that fair? Is that, is that, did that answer your question? I think you can do lots of this actually with, with, but the one thing is that you can't do it with single period. You need to do it with multi periods. Otherwise, how do you model storage? I mean, there's no point putting it for one period. You need it for at least, have you worked with storage? I, I, yeah, I don't know much about storage. I mean, yeah, go on. I think we have to go for lunch. Oh, yeah. Otherwise